Hello, everyone. Thanks for sticking around to join us the last session of the conference. I'm Michelle Miller. I'm an instructional coach and our MTSS lead at Connemaw Valley. It's Sherry Ream. She is our K-2 learning support teacher, and she is now the facilitator of special ed for the elementary school. And Lori Stiles is a paraprofessional with our district, and her role has certainly changed over the past two years. Michelle LaRose, our principal, was here. Um, she got really sick on the first day, and her husband had to come and pick her up, and she had to leave. So she's sorry that she missed it, but she was here with us. So we're going to talk to you about our high dive into MTSS because it truly was high dive. That is not an underestimate. Uh, it was pretty serious. Let me tell you a little bit about who we are at Connemaw Valley. We are a very small district, 688 students, K to 12. Um, we have two buildings on our campus, an elementary building, and that houses K to six, and then a high school has seven through 12. 96.5% of our students are economically disadvantaged. So we have qualified for many years for free breakfast and lunch for every student in our district. Um, 23% of our students receive special education services, which is a pretty high number. And some fun facts about Conemaw Valley, and I don't really know why our principal got sick and had to go home, because she didn't want to do this slide, because she didn't know how to pronounce the Indian term. <laughs> a blue jay is our mascot. I never realized why we had a blue jay until I watched them in the backyard at the bird feeder with other birds, and I realized how mean they are. So they're very aggressive, and um, so it all made sense to me at that point. But the word Connemaw means Otter Creek, and it originated from the Unami Lenape um, language. That's what she didn't want to say. <laughs> um, we're located in Johnstown, which is in southwestern PA, and is approximately 67 miles east of Pittsburgh. Our city is famous for the devastating floods of 1889, 1936, and 1977. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Reem to tell you why we began this journey. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> so why did we begin this journey? Um, because it definitely was a high dive. We went all in and we had some big reasons why. Um, first of all, our learning support numbers were <coughs> skyrocketing. It seemed like every day we were getting new kids that were qualifying for learning support and the numbers were just out of control. In addition to that, our regular education students were not proficient. The ones that were proficient were no longer proficient and we were just going the wrong direction. Um, oh, I got ahead of myself. The few proficient students were going the wrong way. And then of course, COVID. Uh, we hate to blame things on COVID, but if we are truthful, everybody can admit COVID made a huge impact on our students. Um, and then 40% of our staff was non-tenured. So the turnover rate for our staff was huge. We were struggling to keep um, teachers, find teachers, all of that. Um, and the ones that we did have, a majority of them had student taught virtually during COVID. So they didn't even really know what to do in a regular classroom. Um, classroom management was a huge struggle and all of that because they never actually had to interact in person with students. And then the tenured teachers that we did have had lost their spunk. They were just kind of done. Um, they were debating themselves. Do I want to really do this anymore? Um, so we had a lot of obstacles to overcome and it just seemed like everyone, the staff, the students, everybody just kind of lost their motivation to be at school. Um, nobody wanted to come, nobody was putting in their full effort. It was just a very negative environment we had. And then finally, um, we had data gods at our school and they dictated everything. They told the teachers who got to go into small groups, what you were supposed to do, and you had no real say for yourself. Um, and then they left the district and nobody knew what to do with themselves. 
Um, and we went through administration change at the same time. We had a new principal, a new superintendent. So everybody's losing all their motivation and everybody's new at the same time. So it was a really awkward place to be in. So before we really tell you what did we do about all these problems, we wanna see where the room is kind of at right now. So if you look around the room, ignore the smiley faces, the emojis for now, <coughs> and look at the pictures that look like these ones, and think about where are you right now in your journey? And we're gonna make you move. We know it's early in the morning, but where are you in your journey right now? How do you feel about your high dive into the MTSS system? So there's one up front here, which is this first picture. The little boy is over there against the wall. The toes are back there. The actual high dive picture with the little boy laying on it is in the back. Over here, they're jumping in. And then the older couple on their lawn chairs are over here. So where are you in your journey right now? And while you're there, feel free to talk with your group. Why did you pick that poster? What does that poster mean to you guys? Hate <laughs> to end your conversations, but before we make our way back to our yeah. seats, if there's one brave volunteer, it looks like we've kind of got three groups here. So if there's one brave volunteer, maybe from this front group, looks like you guys are all by the little boy. Um, what, what were you guys thinking? Why did you pick that picture? This is the picture they have right here. So we had a couple different interpretations. Some of us saw it as our head is above water some. We know what we're doing, we have some systems, but getting everybody else on board, so we're still kind of treading water, getting through those murky waters. Some of us took it as, um, we're up to here with our work. Mm -hmm. We're above, but we're, we're still treading. And then um, I personally said it's kind of like an iceberg too. You see the tip up here, but you still have all those unknowns and everything else kind of still treading the water down below. I'm not sure if you guys were kind of saying the same thing. Yeah. Good. Thank you, hold on to that. Okay, our next group. You guys are kind of a really large group back there. If somebody wants to volunteer, they've got their toes one here. We said toes because we're starting. We have a process. We know what needs to be done. We don't have the support to do it yet. Um, we're working on it, but it's in the process. We're just getting into it. We're starting with it, so. Thank you. It's definitely a process, and we'll give you some of the trials that we had. Um, our next group back here, they are that picture over there with the guy, I don't know, belly flopping belly maybe. Flop. <laughs> so a couple of, a couple of us are uh, IU TAC, so we're, we're helping other districts take that dive. So they're at different points. Um, some others just expressed that, well, well, we need to do something, so we're just gonna go all in and, and, and give it a try and see how that works. So that's, that's a summary of why we picked it. Perfect. Thank you guys for sharing. And Thank if you, you got one of our little goodies, um, hang on to those. Um, we'll find out more in the future Can about those. Can I just those. say something real quick? I'm glad that nobody is at the two extremes. This one where you literally are underwater, head completely <laughs> submerged, not able to breathe. That's a good sign. Mm -hmm. And it's also a good sign that nobody is sitting on the outside of the pool totally disinterested in the water. So that is another good sign. So it's nice to see that we are all sort of somewhat involved in this process. Um, I don't think it's going to go away. 
<laughs> um, it's definitely a mindset change. And um, this one is also not in the process yet, but, but looking on, thinking you might join the process. I'm glad to see that you are all in it. Mm -hmm. We hope to give you some ideas about how to really get your district participating or maybe how to help you survive a little bit better and tread that water a little more easily. And we're definitely still on our journey, so we're not the experts or anything like that. At this point, we wanted to share with you guys the highs and the lows that we've had is what a lot of this presentation is going to be. So taking the plunge, if you guys want to make your ways back to your seat, Michelle will go into what did it look like when we took the plunge? So we literally had nothing in place, nothing. We had, like we said, a big shift in administration, a big shift in our principal left and took her data gods with her, um, went to another district. We had a principal who is a first time principal. We had a new superintendent. Nobody knew where to start. So um, let's talk about that. We didn't know what to do. We met, I would like Megan and Amanda to just wave to everybody because they have been on this journey with us. They are our IU8 consultants. And we met with them. They told us all about MTSS. And we said, let's do it. So we went out and observed other schools who were successfully implementing MTSS. Um, they're hard to find. We don't have a lot that have fidelity. And we, we did go out and observe. We really went out. We sent our whole entire staff out. Um, we sent our paraprofessionals. We, the principal came with us. We sent our grade levels as a team out to observe what was happening. We found some well-oiled machines where kiddos' needs were the center of the educational system. And when we went to these districts, it was impossible to tell who the paraprofessionals were, who the teachers were, it was really very interesting to us. We thought, wow, that's a lot different than what we do. I mean, our paraprofessionals would walk into the room, hang out a little bit, go over and help kiddos who might be struggling. But these paraprofessionals were full-blown instructing when we went out and, and observed. <coughs> I'm sorry. We looked at our current schedules of all of our staff and paraprofessionals. We found that there was a lot of downtime. Our specials teachers, some of you might call them encore teachers, phys ed, music, art, there were some days where they had three hours of prep time in their schedule. Does anybody have that here? And it was, it was actually a, a point of consternation in our district. We're like, wait a minute, we are pounded in the classrooms. We have so many things to do. And they have three hours a day where they're not doing anything. So that was a problem. Um, we also found that we met with Amanda and Megan to develop a plan for our district. Um, we found that they recommended that we take on reading first and get that established and then tackle math after a few years. We also found that we don't listen very well. <laughs> Um, we decided to go all in with reading and math at the same time because we thought, you know what? Everything's new. If you're making a change, make a big change and go from there. So Amanda and Megan told us we were crazy. We might be, but, but it worked. <laughs> um, so we placed crucial people into rules where they could make this happen. We found that um, instructional coaches were gaining in popularity with our 40% new staff, non-tenured. Instructional coaches would be a great way to get in there and help with that, the new newness of being a teacher, help them with their classroom management, things like that, but also would have that time to be able to set up this whole MTSS philosophy. Um, 
we also had instructional coaches training the paraprofessionals on how to instruct and what to instruct. Um, again, our IU has been crucial to supplying the training to the instructional coaches. Um, Jen Herncane does that and we meet monthly and it's a, it's a great program. So that was another thing. Um, we began attending workshops provided by Patton and Dr. Batch as well as RIU to learn everything and anything about the whole MTSS process. We really educated ourselves and we found all of this information to be overwhelming but also priceless because we've learned so much in the past year, two years actually. So if you're feeling like this, it's okay. We were too, and we're gonna tell you exactly what we did from that point. So first thing we did was look at schedules. <laughs> there were so many days where the whiteboard was, people would walk in and say, what is going on here? because we were trying to find how we could make this work within the time frame of our day. So we had a lot of days where our board looked like this. We moved all of our specials classes to the afternoon. So phys ed, art, music, library, all moved to the afternoon. So that left our whole entire morning open for those teachers to participate in instruction. That was the first step. <clears throat> we decided then to use all of our learning support teachers, specials teachers, Title I teachers, um, and all the paraprofessionals to push into classes for 45 minutes for reading and 45 minutes for math to build that small group explicit instruction that was skill-based into our system. So the whole morning consisted of that. Um, we also increased our specials time to 45 minutes, it was 30 minutes. We increased, increased it to 45 minutes and an attempt to remain on that quarter hour. And then that way we would run in 45 minute blocks for all of our, all of our intervention periods and all of our um, specials as well. Yes, it did increase the prep time for the teachers, which they were appreciative of. So this is what a sample schedule looked like. Um, and we just put it on as MTSS so they would know that that was what it was. We, we have to come up with a creative name for it because we know that MTSS is a philosophy and not a period, but um, that was our small group intervention. So that was like the win time. Um, and we did it four days a week. We did not do it on Fridays because we have early dismissal on Fridays, 1.33 everybody's out of the building on Friday. So that, um, that sort of throws a wrench into things. It's nice, everybody loves it, but it does throw a wrench into things academically. So um, some of the adversities that we faced, we had an odd number of grades, we're K to six. So we were unable to make the schedule work the way we wanted to because we had three lunch periods and we needed staff to cover the lunch periods. So what we did, we added a sixth special to our rotation. Um, we knew that mental health issues were at an all time high after COVID. So we took a gu our guidance counselor and put them into the specials rotation. So the guidance counselor was then going into the classrooms in the afternoon and teaching coping strategies. And you know, just that whole class intervention for mental health and social emotional learning. So we added that, that gave us the sixth special. Um, we knew that our resources had to be evidence-based, but we also knew that we didn't have the money to purchase new materials. So we organized the materials we did have by skill, as well as math and reading. If you would have seen our resource room, it was a complete, it was a dumping grounds for people who didn't want things or people who had extra things. They just took it in, piled it in. Nobody ever used it. So um, we thought, well, we could use some of those materials temporarily until we had the money to purchase evidence-based materials. 
We also copied and laminated materials for the teachers because we knew if they had to do it on their own, they wouldn't do it. So we went into the West Virginia Phonics and Florida Center for Reading Research. We laminated, we printed, laminated, put them into containers, all of the different skill lessons that they had because they are evidence-based. So we had them available for everybody so they wouldn't have to take the time to create them on their own. We figured they'll be more likely to use them if we do it for them. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lori. She's gonna talk about our new resource room. Thanks, Michelle. Um, before I go into my resource room um, presentation, I just wanna take the time to say that Michelle and Sherry are a very vital part of our journey. They continue to do this every day, and um, they're very important to us, and I'm very blessed and honored to be part of the journey with them. So, um, Like Michelle told you, our resource room was a dumping ground. Um, a big reason things got dumped in there, we did have a pre-K in our building. Um, our old principal wanted to eliminate that. So when she eliminated that, um, in the pre-K wing, there were also title um, resources. There were um, flashcards and books and counters and things that the pre-K needed. Um, one of our title teachers also retired, so she had her own room. In that room, there was also resources there were games in there, um, educated games, um, rhyming games, matching games, things like that. They all got dumped in there. So you had the pre-K stuff dumped in there. You had the title things dumped in there. Some of the grade level teachers moved from maybe kindergarten to second grade. So their things got dumped in there, okay? When that resource room got um, too many things in there, Michelle and Sherry are across the hall their room's 227, everything went into Michelle and Sherry's room. Okay, every time we got something new, we didn't know what to do with it, put it in 227. You know, and I work a lot in the summertime with Michelle um, LaRose, our principal, and every time we got something, she goes, Lori, just take that up to room 227. <laughs> uh, the resource room was way too full, so then Michelle and Sherry's room got to be um, the other dumping ground. Um, but we did take um, in those little colored baskets up there, you'll see the manila folders that we uh, laminated our research base from West Virginia Phonics, the materials. On the front cover, um, we took packing tape, put the directions on there, and made copy one copy and put it inside for the aides to take, and then they could do that for their um, MTSS groups. Um, and these ones, we have um, books. They're um, sorted by skill levels. They're sorted by skills, long vowels, short vowels, um, vowel teams, and things like that. Down here, we have our scripted explicit instruction lessons for all the aides. Um, I think we have one of them here. Yes, I was just going to say, that one right there is here. I was gonna say, I don't think. Inside, we have scripted lessons. We have enough laminated materials for a small group. So the teacher or paraprofessional could just pull this out. It was ready to go. If their skill was letter sounds, this is what they would work with. We had them for blends and digraphs. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. vowel, consonant, E. And then that way, the paraprofessionals, if they weren't sure what to do, it was scripted for them. So they knew, we knew that they were getting exactly what they needed at that point. We also sat down with Michelle, who's an instructional coach, and Jen Stifler, who is another instructional coach, and they went over all of this with uh, paraprofessionals. Um, also on the other side of the resource room, you can see we have um, games and learning tools. Um, we still want to have things for fun days. Um, the teachers are encouraged not to use the games, but we also wanted the explicit instruction with that. 
We also have here the teacher resource books um, for our reading and math activities. And then on the other side, we have chapter books um, for smaller groups. I've used these things many times in my MTSS, especially um, on the other, the back slide, we had the vowels and things like that. Also in the summer, I do ESY, and we use a lot of the um, games, the matching games, and the rhyming games. We use those a lot as well. So some of our adversities and solutions. Um, the teachers would have to prepare the materials and having more than one aide in the classroom, um, we thought they would be overwhelmed. So our solution for that was uh, we used the book from the IU, how to plan and differentiate reading instruction and um, it was a scripted and explicit instruction books as well. That's where all of these came from right here. Mm -hmm. um, RIU is really great. They do a lot of book studies. And the instructional coaches took that book study. And this came out of that book study. Um, we also had time for the department chair. Um, I was given a period to do lessons. I created activities. I created some of the, I made copies of the um, how-to sheets and um, got, you, usually each paraprofessional probably has a max of three to four children. So I would have enough made for each of those um, students in the group. And here are what was inside of our little folders here. So we have the scripted lessons. Um, all the materials were in there. They were prepared. Um, the how to teach lessons were in there. And like we said, that was a lot of the um, vowel sounds, syllables, and things like that. So each paraprofessional oh, had one. And inside was everything that they would need for their class. We also had in MTSS, they were also tested, so sometimes they would move to a different skill. So we would also prepare that and sometimes just switch out the folder so that um, we got to use them more so then. I think we're back to you, Michelle. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Um, some other adversities that we faced, uh, teachers would not buy into this change if they were overwhelmed with creating the small group materials for themselves and the paraprofessionals who were in their room. Um, also, the special teachers, who would teach, who would plan those lessons? So initially, the classroom teacher we thought would be responsible for that ended up, they were way too overwhelmed. So we then, like we said, gave the paraprofessional, we created a chair for the paraprofessionals. She took on a lot of that burden for the paraprofessionals to release that from the teachers, which truly helped. Um, we also created math number sense bins for our self-contained teachers, K to two. Um, they already had that extra prep from teaching all the subjects. They teach reading, they teach math, they teach everything. So we didn't want it to be overwhelming for them. The bins, which I have a picture of, contained manipulatives. We had it all in a little carry bin that they could take wherever they went. Um, we had spinners, dice, coins, double-sided counters, clocks. We had enough whiteboards for a small group to work, um, dry erase markers, erasers, and we met with all the teachers and paras and taught them ways to use that kit for quick number sense activities. Um, and quick lesson ideas surrounding number sense. So we also included a number sense idea manual for each grade level. Um, we put this in there so that if they, they did reach the point where they were out of ideas, we had things built in for them that they would be able to go to and just pull out quickly. So we thought enabling them would help with our cause. Um, and, and everybody had this in a little kit, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, it helped the teachers with prepping those ideas, and it also helped the paras understand what we wanted them to specifically focus on in the instruction. So this is what the kit looked like, 
everybody got that. We had touch math in there because some of the teachers were using touch math. Um, we had subitizing cards just to build that sense of numbers. We had tens frames, ones frames, hundreds, tens, ones, part, part, whole number lines, and then all the counters, coins. That way they couldn't say, we don't have, we don't have this stuff. We can't do this. We don't have it. Yeah, you do. <laughs> so it was sort of a way of protecting our interests too because yes, you do. Here it is. It's created for you. You don't have an excuse not to do it. Um, and they were portable. So no matter where the teacher, or the aide was working, they could grab that bin, go to that spot, and have every single thing they need right there. Um, that helped tremendously. In the number sense ideas binder, they were given, um, here were the different activities that we put in them for the different grades. And, and that was an option too, of just pulling it out. We gave them ideas about, you know, rolling die and saying, uh, you know, which, which number is larger, put them in order. You know, just simple things like that. We, we trained them on those activities as well. Um, and, and when we started this, we tried to plan for skills that the students often had difficulty with in the past, and our number sense was weak overall. It was horrible. And we knew that we needed a stronger foundation in number sense, so that was what led us to create this. Also, writing was an issue. Um, our writing scores were horrible. So we did also create writing journals um, in, in the math realms, like math in real life, number sense, time and measurement, money, geometry and fractions, addition and subtraction, and graphing. The writing in the small groups was not quite as successful as we had hoped it would be. So we ended up getting rid of that and sticking with the number sense. They really have blossomed with number sense, though. Sherry's going to talk about some more adversities here. So real quick, when she was talking about the writing, I think one of the biggest things why it didn't, wasn't successful is we were asking paraprofessionals, specials teachers that were willing to jump in and help try to teach writing. And they didn't really know what that should look like. Um, so that was just definitely an obstacle that we had and we had to overcome. So our next adversity was our fifth and sixth grade, we thought in our heads, would be great, let's get them ready for junior high and make their schedule look more like a junior high schedule. Um, so they would rotate through a bunch of classes. And we quickly realized that they were struggling to have enough time for their core instruction, let alone adding in these intervention periods that we were trying to add. So we could not figure out a way to add in 30 minutes of intervention let alone 30 minutes of reading and math intervention into their schedules and still give them enough time to have that core. Because you can't, like they say, our IU friends back there say all the time, you can't intervene, intervene your way out of a poor core. Well, we weren't giving them time for their core if we were trying to add this intervention. So what we did instead is we created a class in that rotating schedule of lots of little classes an intervention class. So we made one teacher our intervention teacher and we would flood her room with all of the supports rather than having an intervention period where like the whole grade level shut down like in K through four and it was an intervention period. So that was our solution that way. And then they kind of had to pick and choose. Um, would they do reading and math? Would they do just reading? Would they do just math? And she worked very closely with the instructional coaches and looked at data and really figured out what was the best for those kids. What did that particular group of kids need? Um, and a very important note was all of this work that we are talking about, all of these extra things we created, looking at these schedules, we did before the school year even started. We were very fortunate that our school district paid a core team of people to come in over the summers and organize that resource room, create these materials for the teachers. The district was very supportive and realized that we needed the time to be able to do this. So it wasn't like we were trying to do this 
as the teachers were teaching. We had this done before they came in the first day of school and were prepping for stuff. So they knew this was coming. Another adversity we had, oh, this is Lori, sorry, Lori, I'm still in your thunder. <laughs> That's okay, thanks, Sherry. Like Michelle has um, said, um, the paraprofessionals have a different look now. Um, we're, we have our own groups a lot of times throughout the day, which I love. It's something that I've always, I, I was a coach for 35 years, so I enjoyed that role of being a leader. Um, like some of you said, how do you get these people on board? Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes you still have people saying, oh, I don't know if that's my job. So the buy-in's not always there, but we have leaders at our school that I know what it takes to be a leader. I was a coach, and these girls, I would fall into battle any day, and Michelle LaRose is the same way. Um, she's so excited. They're so excited about it, and it makes you excited about it. So we wanted to make sure that all of our bases were covered and um, we were just properly trained. And we can I mention something too? We did, the contract was opened for the paraprofessionals and realizing how much we were asking them to do, they did get a $4 an hour mm -hmm. increase in salary. So that was critical. Um, we knew that we were asking them to do a lot. And although they're not teachers, they're really in the role of teachers right now. So we did open up the contract and give them a $4 an hour raise, which was nice. Yes. So um, we took a class um, offered by the IU8. It was called um, Act 91 Classroom Management. The title was uh, Effectively Managing the Classroom for Paraeducators. What's happening also, I'm sure many of you are going through this now too, it's hard to get subs, it's hard to get teachers, and right now I am in charge of the fourth grade art program. <laughs> so we have each aide, one's in charge of kindergarten art, one's in charge of first, second, we're all, we all have an art class. And honestly, it's one of the biggest rewards. You see them doing their math, you see them doing their reading, but to watch them create something with their own hands and using their imagination is honestly a reward. And I know that I enjoy every minute of it. So um, this is another reason because that's the teacher's prep. So they're leaving the classroom. So like we said, we wanted to make sure our bases were covered with us being in the classroom. So. And, it, and it's easy when you have paras like Lori, honestly. Um, she has really embraced this, and she takes work home, and we try to talk her out of that, but she doesn't listen. <laughs> um, and then the next thing that we really realized was our learning support model was not following this MTSS model that we were moving towards. We had a pullout classroom for learning support for K to two, and we had a pullout classroom for learning support for three to six. And as we're moving towards this MTSS model, we're going to all these trainings and all we keep hearing is, oh, it's for all, it's for all. And we're like, well, we're not doing that. We have most of the kids, but there's those few that they just need to go down the hallway. And we really had that mentality of a pullout classroom. And a lot of our classroom teachers had that mentality of like, I don't know what to do with these kids. They can't be in my room. And it was definitely a mindset change that we had to overcome. Um, we had a very serious come to Jesus talk with Amanda and Megan. And we were putting all of our learning support kids in one classroom for convenience for us. We, we had a few learning support teachers and we couldn't spread them out. And they said, why are you doing that? And we said, well, <laughs> then we can teach them, you know, more similar things at the same time. And not and just for said, convenience, but for ease too, because they were the learning support kids, but then all the other low kids that needed that extra help, they got thrown in that classroom too. So it was an overall low classroom, not just like, oh, there's a few learning support kids in here. It was, it was the low classroom for and sure. And Megan and Amanda said, mm, you're setting them up for failure. That's fine. We said, <laughs> what do you mean? They said, this goes against everything the MTSS philosophy is. 
you're like, okay, okay. So we made a compromise the first year. Yes. Sherry will uh, <laughs> talk about that. But then this year we have made serious changes and the teachers are actually loving having the mixed ability groups. So we did, we did learn. So like Michelle said, we took baby steps. We didn't want to overwhelm people. So the first step that we did is we got rid of that K to two pull out classroom. We put those kids into the classroom full time to start. We still kept though the three to six. We didn't want to overwhelm people. Those three to six kids were so used to being in that self-contained classroom where there were just a few kids and stuff like that. So we started by putting them into the core classroom um, and we would have the learning support teachers push into the classroom and co-teach and we had to look at their schedules. And the co-teaching really wasn't working necessarily because of that, oh, they're all over the place now. So it became more of a focus of these learning support teachers will pull them in a separate time if need be, if they really need that little bit of extra boost of instruction, but their primary time they're gonna see them is during those intervention periods. So but during those intervention periods, they would see them um, in the small group setting, but it was nice. It wasn't like, oh, I'm the learning support teacher, so I go in and pull all of my learning support kids in one group because that's still not the MTSS model either because it's supposed to be skill-based and not every single kid just because their learning support needs the same skill. So we were kind of doing a rotating thing. So I would see all of my learning support kids at different points as they rotated through the groups and work on different skills with them as they came to me, but I didn't necessarily go in and just pull all of them at one time, if that makes sense. But we did also offer, like she mentioned, the co-teaching. We offered as an instructional coach, I did a book study with co-teaching where the teachers were paid to stay after school. We actually had 17 people sign up, um, mm -hmm. volunteer. They would make $25 an hour to stay after school and do this co-teaching book study. I was thrilled with 17 participants. Um, you know, we are a small district. That's a, that's a large number for us. So again, we did offer them the training to be able to go in and co-teach in those environments and, and that was very successful as well. Did you have a question? Do you mind if I bring you the mic so you can, the camera can hear you? What my question was. <laughs> oh, okay, so when you got rid of the, the K2 pullout program, did you completely get rid of it? Yes. Or was it just for, so it wasn't just for MTSS intervention times, it's now gone? Completely gone. Me, um, so the, it was a little tricky because their IEPs are a legal document and their IEP said supplemental. So we had a lot of consultation about that because we didn't want to be not adhering to their IEPs, but at the same time, we didn't want to, we wanted to start pushing them in. So we created a block in the morning where we were doing a lot of our tier three during that block. And as the learning support teacher, I did use that time to pull just learning support students and have almost my own little mini pull out classroom time during that time so they were still getting those supplemental hours that they had. Um, and against our school psychologist's wishes, I then, um, we were quickly realizing these kids were probably over, um, we didn't really give them the chance. They were probably assessed too early, that kind of stuff. So after doing that for a year, um, our school psychologist was not overly happy with me, but I had all of them. They were all due for reavals anyways. I had them reassessed and then we opened up the IEPs and looked at it. So because of them having IEPs, we did have to be very cautious in how we handled that. We couldn't just throw them back in because they did have that in their IEPs and stuff like that. So we did have to work very closely looking into a lot of like the legality of it also that way. Um, so we did get rid of like the classroom itself. There was no more K to two classroom, but we still did give them their hours and their time using that time in the morning when a lot of the other kids were being pulled for tier three. I was doing instruction with just the learning support kids during that time. And then I was seeing them during the intervention periods. Does that help? Okay. <laughs> 
You're welcome. Our three to six, though, the teachers, the kids, were so used to being in that self-contained. We didn't want to make too big of a jump all at one time. So we did continue to have that traditional pull-out classroom for them, for their reading, their math, or both that they needed. Um, but we are in the process now of phasing them out. And for example, this year, we have no third graders in the pull-out classroom due to those reassessments and reopening IEPs, having those conversations with the families and explaining the process we were going to. Most of the families were so excited that like, wait, you think my kid can be in a regular ed classroom? You think you can make their needs be met in a regular ed classroom. I don't think I had a meeting with a single family that wasn't excited that we were proposing, hey, we think your kid's gonna be successful in a regular ed classroom. And so we're slowly trying to phase it now into our three through six, but we didn't wanna make that big jump with the three to six at the same time because they were so used to it for so many years. So they'll be grandfathered out. Um, like the fourth graders are still in that classroom they'll they'll remain through sixth grade but this year we have no third graders next year we'll have no fourth graders so then after two years in the system we we should not have a three to six pull out classroom but if i could just kind of say what i'm hearing just mm -hmm. for clarity's sake you didn't eliminate IEPs, you didn't eliminate oh, no. special no. education services. Oh, no. You changed no. your service delivery model. Yes. Yes. And brought it into alignment with your core instruction and your tiered levels of support. Yes. So you, you were you were still providing the services just yes. in a different model than you ever had before. Correct. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. And that was a lot of looking at the IEPs, looking at how they were written, having those meetings with the families. There was a lot of paperwork, unfortunately, when it came to the kids that were identified um, and making this work for them. And you will see the success those students have had has been remarkable. When we assessed at the beginning of the year, many of our student identified learning support students came out green and blue on benchmark and above benchmark for the beginning of the year assessments. So it's been tremendous. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a new adversity that we don't have up here now, though. At the same time of <laughs> finding that time now to see some of those kids is becoming a little bit more, oops, sorry, a little bit more unique because before they were all below. So they were all at least in the room that I was in that I was able to see them at different points. And now some of them aren't in that room working on those foundational skills anymore. They've mastered those foundational skills. So... It's a new adversity that we're working on this year and figuring out schedules. I think my schedule changes, I don't daily. know, weekly maybe, daily. daily. It's a good problem <laughs> to have. Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna come back here so you can have a microphone. They told me you guys were talking to the microphone so the camera can hear you. <laughs> so I'm just curious about your emotional support classrooms. Do you continue to have those? We never had an emotional support. Okay. So we never had an emotional support classroom. The students that had severe emotional support um, where they did need to be in an emotional support classroom, unfortunately we did have to put them in outside, like we, they've always been at outside placements in our district. And the kids that we were able to keep within our district with emotional support or autistic support or those kind of things do still have sessions. So the schedules work out that the special education teachers do have time in their schedules to have those push-in sessions, those pull-out sessions, those kind of things, if need be. Kind of just like an OT, a PT, speech, those type of services would be. And I saw another hand. I think you probably answered that qu my question with hers, but life skills. Do you have a life skills classroom? No. Okay. No, we don't. Our district is such a small district. Um, we don't have any of those, all of those type of students, um, unfortunately, do get sent to outside placements. Life skills, any of those kids that you would consider like a full-time emotional support, a full-time autistic support, 
those go to outside placements. Um, we don't even have a spot in our buildings really that we could house those. Um, so the majority of our kids were either labeled supplemental learning support or itinerant learning support. We never had those profound ones. I was, um, was going to say, did I say oh. oh, go ahead. Um, so how much time needs to be spent um, in the intervention, like when they're doing MTSS reading or? For the learning support, you mean? or no, just in, in general. general. Um, we found that to be a thing. You really have to look at the interventions that you're using and make sure that you find ones that fit into your schedule. Last year, we tried to do 45 minutes um, of reading and math. This year, we did take a step back to 30 minutes for reading and math both, with the exception of still those upper grades, the five and six. We still only have that one block of 30 minutes. Just because of scheduling, we weren't able to figure out how to get two blocks for them still to have enough time for that core. So right now, we're prioritizing reading and if a student is proficient in reading, then they can have math intervention. We just decided if they can't read, again, with our IU help, they kind of helped us um, prioritize that if they can't read, they're still gonna struggle with that math, especially at that higher level. Amanda didn't say that. <laughs> She's our math person. She said, as much as I hate to say this. <laughs> um, but yeah. that's been one of our biggest adversities is how to get that time for those older kids. And, and we do have new cores. We have a new core math that's only, this is our third year. Um, so that's K to six. So we are learning that and how to build our interventions in with that core program. We have a new um, reading K to two. This is our second year for that and a brand new reading three to six. That, that we're figuring out. And so, you know, we're trying to make sure that our interventions match what we need and the time frames, and still give the kiddos that, that what they need in the time frame that fits within our schedule. So these are definitely obstacles that, we're, that, that are new to us right now that um, have come about since last year. <laughs> Okay, so I have a few questions. So I am a school psychologist, so that would have been a nightmare to yes. reevaluate and all of that. But um, in the same time, we are a very small school district, so it actually was only three kids. Okay. So just to make so you I realize, I'm not like that mean person that was like, you have to reevaluate a whole class of 20 kids. It was three kids. <laughs> so I have a question about like how you had your pullout classes set up. So were they getting the core curriculum still adapted and modified, or was it a completely different? Eh. And <laughs> my, the reason I'm asking that is because you're seeing some of those blue and whatever, like that increase in skills. But if they weren't getting the core curriculum, I feel like that probably led to some of those deficits that you were seeing yes. and not using those evidence-based interventions. That was a huge part of our problem. Okay. It was kind of like, you do what you want in your own little world in that classroom. You figure out what works best for you and those kids. We don't really have anything for you. And so some of them were like trying to pull stuff from the core curriculum that like everybody else was using and adapting it. Some of them were just doing whatever was easiest. It was, there was no consistency in those pull out classrooms. And I do think that's why once those little ones got exposed to the same core, the same grade level content as everybody else, they made those gains so quickly. They were getting those evidence-based practices and the core. And in complete transparency, um, some of our learning support professionals really babied those kids. The expectation was not where it needed to be. And we recognize that um, as, as an MTSS team. And so that was a huge point of pushback was from some of the learning support teachers because we were throwing them to the wolves. We were expecting way too much from them. And in all actuality, that was what needed to happen. So were they getting identified and going right into supplemental learning support? Some of them, yes. Some of them, yes. Ooh. Yes. Because mm -hmm. if you're thinking about the progression of <laughs> levels of placement, 
you want to try itinerant learning support, provide those evidence-based practices. And that, and that goes so, back to yeah, those data gods we I'm talked about a long it, time ago. <laughs> yes. We didn't really have a lot of say in a lot of that. It was, we were kind of told, like, this is what you need to propose at your IEP meeting. And this is what we're going to do. And we're giving the teachers a lot more of that power now. And our school, psycho school psychologist is slowly, I think, becoming on board with what we're doing and really seeing like, oh, like, yeah, we do need to do this. I think at first she thought I was completely crazy when I asked yeah, her, I like, mean, let's reassess look, these kids. I look at it from the lens of like least restrictive environment. You can't, if itinerant level wasn't even tried, how do you know that that wasn't effective to make them more restrictive in a supplemental environment. So right. And sense. some of them were coming in from preschool yeah. with full-blown IEPs. So that was really out of our hands prior yeah. to our preschool even. And so, you know, that was part of the issue. Uh, I will be honest, the learning support teacher that we are talking about who, who had complete say of our learning support program prior to the whole MTSS movement, has left the elementary school and moved to the high school. She said, I can't do with this, deal with this anymore. These people are making me crazy. I can't, I can't see these kids go through this. But in actuality, the kiddos are benefiting from it. Well, they even really them, from, them coming from preschool, most times academics, like I wouldn't even say that they should be in learning support at that point because how do you know if they're... <laughs> Um, we agree. You're, you're saying everything we were proposing, <laughs> but we were getting some pushback from things that were out of our control. And that was, the, that was part of the reason we made such a huge jump when we had new administration and new support for us mm -hmm. in the vision that we were seeing. Yes. I agree 100%. I wish we would have been. I honestly <laughs> wish we would have been because it, it was maddening to us. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm just curious of when you were, when, how often you're looking at the data, um, how often you're, you're changing up the groupings, mm -hmm. and how you manage that as yeah. a team. That's coming up here in one of our slides, but a quick answer to that question before we go into detail on the slides. Um, we're using the paraprofessionals, like we said, that they have that now classroom management, that they're able to work with the kids while the teachers, um, once every two weeks during those intervention periods, we, I don't want to say cancel the intervention periods because the aides are still doing stuff with them, but it's more of a whole group as compared to a small group thing. Um, and the teachers that are all in those periods are sitting down and looking at the data and making those decisions. And that was definitely a process to get to that also. And that's why I said we'll talk more about it here in the upcoming slides. But that's a quick answer to your question. It's every two weeks. There are continuing to be more <laughs> questions, and that's great. We want yeah, this dialogue. <laughs> I also anticipate that some of the questions might be answered on future slides. Mm -hmm. um, a quick question here, though, I think was about the reading series that you're using. You mentioned a new reading series. We did. We, we have Super Kids, which was not popular. <laughs> um, a lot of people had never heard of it. Um, and that's what we went with K-2, to two, and we are thrilled with it. Sometimes I feel like it's a little slow at the kindergarten level, but it fits our clientele. And you, you can always move it faster, but that slower pace and that it's very thorough. So that has been wonderful for us. Also, um, in, they recommended, and it was interesting because we're gonna talk about the patent grant we received, and our patent representatives tried to steer us away from the series that we went with for three to six because they said it would be too hard for us at this point. But in reality, reading series will stay with you for <laughs> how many years? So we knew that we wanted to look to the future, so we went with read side by side. And that is sort of the next step. Super Kids doesn't have a three to six program, but read side by side is the piece that fits best with the super kids. So we're hoping that it is tough this year, but 
We are hoping that with the coaching and helping those teachers get through this difficult initial year, any, any initial year with a new series is hard, um, but then the kids coming up with that experience from the super kids will just make that transition a little bit smoother. And I know you had a question, but I'm going to recommend that we if you can hold it. And we're going to do some question and answer, I believe, at the end. Yes. Yeah, yeah. we have built in question and answer also, but we don't mind. Um, so this was all, for the most part, before the school year started. We tried to work on all of this, the schedules, the everything before the school year started. So now it's time to finally start school. And what's our plan now? First thing we did is we created what we called a SWAT team. Our SWAT team were, was made up of pretty much anyone that didn't have a classroom. Our learning support teachers, our title teachers, our instructional coaches, and they were the ones that were going to go in and do our benchmarking with the kids. Because prior to this, benchmarking would take a month at minimum, I would say, Minimally a month to do. And again, like we keep saying, we are a very small school. So like it was drug, drug out. The so, data gods would meet for, <laughs> we, we wouldn't have intervention periods for six weeks, seven weeks while they were assessing and putting the data together. So instead, we came up with this. Well, we didn't come up with it. We actually borrowed it from one of the places we had went to observe. They used this model. And we thought, oh, that's amazing. And so the SWAT team goes in, and we hit one homeroom at a time really, really hard and move through the grade levels, getting all of that assessments done in a week, a week a and week, a half sometimes now. Sometimes a week and a half makeups and things like that. But yes, down to a week and a half. Um, and then we use that benchmark. Um, results and we administered diagnostics we had never done that before we based it off of you're a red kid you're a yellow kid you're a blue kid you're a green kid that's how your groups were made so now we started administering these diagnostics to get those skill-based groups for the kids and um, we um, for a phonemic awareness we were using Hegarty because the kids were already having Hegarty in the classroom and they had a really quick Mm -hmm. um, and fairly effective, and again, free, because it was with our Hegarty. And then we were also using Really Great Reading, another free resource, which is always great to find those free resources when you're making such a huge change, because you can't purchase everything you would ideally like to have. We have switched our um, diagnostics, and we'll talk about that because mm -hmm. of our um, ability to purchase interventions at this yeah. point. And then after that first benchmark, we started including the classroom teachers in looking at the data. Before, like we've said previously, the data gods would look at the data, they would tell us what to do. They would maybe have a little meeting with us and be like, do you think there's any behavior problems, that kind of thing. But we really didn't have much say in what kids were in which groups. So now the instructional coaches taught the classroom teachers how to look at that data what should they be looking at in that data? What does this data even mean? And having those meetings, giving those classroom teachers more buy-in one and more power. And then, like your question, twice a month, we gave the teachers time again to look at their progress monitoring data. Most kids that were either red or yellow were getting progress monitored every two weeks, so we figured that would be a great time for us to also look at the data. So we put it across the board every first and third Thursday. No intervention periods. Instead, they're gonna be data times during those blocks. Um, and that's how they would move the kids from group to group. Because in our MTSS system, you wanna make sure that their skills are getting met. And then after the second benchmark in January, the teachers again met with those instructional coaches. But this time, the teachers started having more control um, the first time the instructional coaches kind of showed them how to do it, this time the teachers started leading the way and figuring out how to move those kids, who should be in which group, what skills do they need, those kind of things. Um, and we also started some PLC meetings um, where the teachers were able to group the students independently. It kind of gave them that little bit more instruction with those instructional coaches 
And at this point, almost two years later, some of our teachers are amazing at looking at that data and being like, okay, we need to group these kids together, work on this skill, and like, we're really starting to see that fluid movement between groups really led by the classroom teachers themselves. So we're gonna get you up and moving. You guys have been sitting for a long time. So what are you thinking right now? We have some smiley faces around the room. Um, we have the one with the question mark is over here. The one with the thumbs down is kind of there in the middle and the thumbs up is over here. Um, are you thinking like, hey, we can definitely do this um, or at least some of this at our school? Um, the question mark, I'm not sure if we can really do this at our school. Um, or the thumbs down over here, I just don't really think this is something our school could do. So take a minute, get yourselves moving, you've been sitting for a while. Find one of the emojis, see what fits you best, and have a little bit of a discussion with your group. She's always the ringleader, it's always her fault. She's always the one that doesn't follow directions. <laughs> Miss Miller. We're gonna move on, Miss Miller. <laughs> She's ignoring me. <laughs> I loved some of the conversations, and I'm not gonna put my friend over here on the spot unless she wants to share, but like I loved the vulnerability and um, the honesty of some of the obstacles that it sounds like some of you guys are also facing. And like I was explaining, um, to the girl I was talking to who was saying, I don't really think my school's gonna be on board with this. Um, don't let us like fool you. Like we've definitely made huge strides, but we are still hitting obstacles daily. Um, and putting out fires, I think sometimes too. Like it's not just little obstacles, it's like a whole fire blows up some days it seems like. So don't let us fool you that like, oh, this is like the perfect path. We've definitely come over some big obstacles definitely moving in the right direction, but you're gonna hit pushback. Yeah. And, and right now, um, because our principal is so new, um, she's really drowning in, in everyday things. So it's really critical to have a team of people that you can count on to keep pushing, even though you may not um, they have to be steadfast and they have to be willing to keep going when times get tough. Um, I know we're facing a lot of issues. Our, our union is bringing up issues of why, why don't these teachers have classrooms? What are they doing? They don't have classrooms. We see the three of us sitting, we see the three of them sitting at the table just not doing anything. So, you know, we are facing all of those things and, and that's okay mm -hmm. because we, we know what we're doing and, um, and we see the benefits already. And so. the data and numbers are really starting to support what we're doing also. They definitely are. And so hopefully that'll give us some leverage with some of these arguments here in the near future also. Okay. So All right. our biggest obstacles, I think that's you now. Yep. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, our biggest obstacles, of course, attitudes. You're going to have that no matter what. Our new principal really wants to be liked and, and be open. And I said to her, Michelle, sometimes no matter what you do, people will dislike you for no reason at all. So um, it was mostly senior staff. We have a team of first grade teachers who is amazing. They have very few years experience. None of them are tenured. And they are such go-getters. They're calling every day. Hey, can I do this with my, my dad is showing this. Can I do this? Can I move these kiddos here and this? So, it's really amazing. Those senior teachers, most of them are coming along. Um, there will be some that will never, will never jump on board. And that's okay. Yes, we, I was telling a group that I was talking to, we had an art teacher who said, I just want to teach art. I don't want to do this. <laughs> that's why Lori's doing it now. Hot, art teachers are a hot commodity. Um, and that's okay. But... I feel as though things are changing in education and, and just being an art teacher may not be an option in the future. 
So, you know, you take that risk and, and that's okay. You follow your path and we'll continue to follow ours. Um, so what we did to try to bring people together as a team, we have four wings in our elementary school um, and they're different colors. One is orange, one is blue, green, and purple. And so we implemented a wing thing challenge for team building purposes where the teachers and the students work together. Um, every couple weeks, I'd say, once a month, once a month yeah, to um, do, participate in an activity where the teachers and students work together, but then they compete against the other hallways. And um, that seems to have helped with some of the attitudes a little bit. They like... <clears throat> Even if you're not housed in that hallway because you're a specials teacher or cafeteria, cafeteria worker, custodian. any custodian, like everybody, if you are a person in our building, you are any team. So those teachers that do travel to every grade level, we kind of just split them up and put them on teams. But every single adult is a member of a team in our building. Um, to try to really unite everybody. It's not just those classroom teachers with their students. Um, the sub shortage is real. Um, there are often no substitutes for the paraprofessionals. So when you have these people expected to be teaching a small group and they're not there and there's no substitute for them, we needed to come up with a solution. Um, we are a one-on-one -on -one Chromebook district so we have Chromebooks for every student and we subscribe to Moby Max um, which is a great computer program that gives them a path specific to the student um, and it's we subscribe to reading and math so if an adult is absent for a rotation those students work independently on their own Moby Math packs path which is again to at their level so that helps <laughs> she does it all. Um, this is such a philosophy change that we have to, and, and we're working on it, but we are not anywhere near successful with this. Teachers believe we need more time for core and less for intervention. And, and some of those teachers will labor that, those skills in the core forever. And you could give them six hours and it wouldn't be enough for their core. So that is a huge thing. Um, we did a book study on engagement strategies. That one had, I think, 27 people sign up to come to it. Um, and so we, I taught engagement strategies and showed them how to use them in their classrooms. Um, we showed them ways to get the students involved as active learners rather than passive learners and you know, get more bang for your time in that, in that core instruction. And, and some of the teachers really embrace that. Some of them still have a hard time. They just want to be that sage on the stage. And, and, and I think that is a philosophy change. And I think that has to come from administration. So like I said, she's in the weeds a lot. And um, she is working on and getting into the classrooms more and, and letting the teachers know that that's what she's expecting. But it is hard for her right now. She, um, she swamped. Um, a lot of teachers insisted we didn't need math intervention time. They're like, nope, we don't need math. We just need reading. And so we used the data to show the severity of our math crisis. I think at one point, our fourth grade PSSA scores had 17% proficient and advanced. It was horrible. And so, you know, we, we talked about that and show them that there are careers where kiddos use math and, and we're doing these kiddos a disservice if we don't give them what they need. And so um, we are still doing math intervention. However, I will say we purchased spring math. Thanks to Amanda. We purchased spring math and we are seeing new problems because our computation scores in two years have soared from the use of spring math. And um, so now our intervention groups are not focused on computation anymore, but more on concepts and applications. And trying to find evidence-based <laughs> practices for math is really hard, although I got some good ideas yesterday in my, in my classes that I took here. Um, 
but that's hard. So that's a new problem for us, but it's a great problem to have. I'm willing to try, you know, hey, I'll, I'll tackle that as long as our scores keep moving in that direction. So that was a, that was a blessing, honestly. So our glows and grows, um, last year after one year of full-blown MTSS system, both our kindergarten and second grade achieved our 80% proficiency goal in both reading and math. So that was just one year in. Fifth grade students moved 22. Now fifth grade, keep, keep in mind, is the one that just had one period, one 30 minute period for, actually maybe it was 45 minutes, 45 minutes um, that was dedicated to that intervention and it was whatever they needed, reading, math. Um, they moved 22 students from below proficiency to proficient or advanced. Yes, 22 out of 70, mm -hmm. yeah. Our number sense was becoming stronger across the board, and when we swatted math this year, I could not believe, I was, like, it was hard for me to contain as I'm testing these kiddos, and they're getting more and more and more answers. I'm like, oh my goodness, like, it was so exciting to benchmark them because you just couldn't believe what they were doing at this point, which was really nice. The teachers now know how to interpret the data and move the students in groups by themselves. Sometimes I'll still call with questions or ask, and we do, the coaches will be sitting in on their, all their data meetings still just to monitor, but they're doing everything themselves. Um, our supplemental learning support kiddos were not only surviving in this setting, but they were thriving. I mean, truly thriving. And the kiddos love moving through those intervention periods. They said, the day goes so fast. Or if we don't have, if we have to cancel intervention for some reason, they're like, what do you mean we don't have our, our time? So they, their day seems to go faster for them and it, it keeps things moving a little bit. Some areas where we need to improve. We still needed to implement evidence-based materials. Uh, like I said, for math, they're really hard to find. Spring math is one, but we use that whole class intervention. Um, paraprofessionals needed that planning time of their own to help take more ownership of their lessons. Lori was doing it for them, but then they become dependent upon that. When you spoon, spoon feed somebody, they, they want you to keep spoon feeding them, and they kept saying, Lori, I need this. Lori, I need that. So we get smarter in this process too. <laughs> um, the kiddos who were in the primary grades during COVID though were so far behind. That's our fourth graders this year. They were so far behind that they're making progress but they're not showing enough growth to catch up. I honestly don't know if we'll ever solve that problem completely. Um, I, I fear that COVID will impact these kiddos for the rest of their life. If they were in the primary grades during that time, I fear that no matter how much progress you make, they're still going to see the, the effects of that. Um, again, this is one of our, just can't figure this one out. The intermediate grades only having time in their day for one intervention period. So we have to support them with reading or math. Um, that bothers us a lot. We have not been able to get that creativity moving enough to figure out what to do with that. So if anybody has any suggestions, we're open. <laughs> Let us know. Um, and we needed a consistent lesson plan format because everybody was just doing their own thing. So from the grows, what we decided we would work on this year, and we did receive a large boost from the comprehensive grant that we were awarded from Patton, and it allowed us to purchase all of our evidence-based tier three reading materials which was glorious. So we now have that in play and we're using, we are, um, we've done a lot of the 95% group and we are using their diagnostics now instead of, well, kindergarten still decided to go with Hagerty because it matched their <laughs> curriculum better. But um, we are using the diagnostics, the PSI and the PASI that go with the 95% group um, instead of the free one that we had from really great reading. Um, all intervention teachers have been trained on that, on how to use the interventions. They'll be monitored and used for all tier three students. Tier three is underway and going well. 
Um, we did provide prep time for every paraprofessional this year in their schedule to prepare their own materials. We are there if they need advice or if they need help. Um, and, and some of them do come to us. Some of them just complain and go find it themselves, but complain along the way. And that's okay too. Um, so they are prepping all of their materials for their intervention periods. And they're using scripted programs such as Dibbles. Dibbles has a very nice prescription for students um, based upon the skill that they're working on. So they use that, you can go in and print it out. It's, it's very scripted. Um, Florida Center for Reading Research, they're also using, which is free. For math, we use Acadians and Spring Math Resources. And we're still on the search for some additional evidence-based math products. I know that um, Zaner Blozer has a number sense one that I'm looking at right now, but I don't know anything about it at this point. Um, we're still puzzled at how to best support those fourth through sixth graders who have that one intervention period um, and often the same kiddos struggle in reading and math. So we've tried a variety of things. One we're currently experimenting with is adding um, the, the PALS, that peer assisted learning strategy where you um, put the kiddos in order, high to low, then you break it in half and the top of the high works with the top of the low and they do reading at the lower, um, lower student's ability level. And then they take turns, um, read, do a retell, like a 10 word retell. Um, and we're putting that into the science and social studies block to try to free up some of that ELA time so that we can maybe get more interventions in there and then open up a math block with that intervention time. So we'll let you know next year how that works for us. Um, we'll see. But we also attended um, Dr. Batch's presentation of use, use of data to inform instruction, and that was very helpful. And we did take a UDL model format for the um, lesson plans. And what we're looking at is here, um, of course, the standard the material, explicit instruction, which um, was huge. When Patton came in and observed for the grant, they found that not a lot of teachers were using explicit instruction or engagement strategies. So we are really focusing on that. And through the coaching, I'm doing a lot of that work in the classrooms with the teachers. Um, and then the multiple means of engagement, which we need, um, which will also allow us to get more bang for our buck in the um, core. Multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression. And then the self-reflection is what we included on ours. And that came straight out of Dr. Batch's um, course that we took. Um, progress with the lesson plans has been very slow. Oh, sure. I know, and one of the things that we used to have, and it's nice to have this format for lesson plans now is, classroom teachers would plan their core lesson and then hand learning support teachers their lesson plans and be like, now you do the differentiating. So it's kind of forcing them to collaborate with the learning support teacher as compared to just giving them their lesson plans and being like, here, differentiate this for me. So it's kind of, it's forcing in a good way that collaboration with this new lesson plan format. Um. So this is a very slow process. Again, teachers are like, we can't do one more thing. So we've allowed them to crawl a little bit this year. Um, but the second half of the year, they will be expected to fully implement that. Um, so we are going to implement that format. The evidence-based tier two and three reading materials with fidelity, that is one of our goals. And we are keeping track of all the interventions and all the students who are receiving those interventions and their progress. So we are looking at all that to make sure that it's done with fidelity. If the intervention isn't working, we're going to switch interventions and you know, look at all that, that data as we go. Um, and we're gonna look at rate of improvement for individual students to track a detailed progress a little bit more. As of, as of now, we haven't been looking at the specific rate of improvement, so we are going to look at that. Um, we're gonna ensure that teachers are using engagement strategies and beefing up their core instruction. So my role will be to go into the classrooms and, and really help them implement those engagement strategies and um, explicit instruction. Um, 
Any questions, comments, or advice? I know that we, I was asked if we could include our um, PowerPoint, our Google Slides presentation. So I can send that to somebody, I'm assuming, to upload. Okay, perfect. Anybody have any questions? Sure, that would be great. Okay, so my first one was, is your MTSS intervention periods for reading and math just like the what I need period? Just because our school already uses a what I need period, including everybody in the building. So I just wanted to see if it was something we are already doing. It is, and it, but they're very, very specific right now. Um, before we did what I need, and we would talk as teachers when the data gods told us who our groups were, we would say, these kiddos are not on the same level. Like, what are, what are we supposed to do? And now they are very specific skills. So that's, that's the big difference for us in the change in, in our what I need periods. And then my second one was just that I'm a speech language pathologist. I didn't know if they had one for the district. And if so, are they involved in those MTSS interventions and how their group and scheduling for taking their own IEP students out would work? And we do not, we currently are PTOT speech. They are all contracted through outside agencies. So we do not force them to do our um, win periods. Now at the same time though, our speech teacher does occasionally push in because she likes to see them in those small groups. And I, I love when she pushes in because a lot of times the skills I'm working in on as the K to two learning support teacher are those sounds and stuff and so she's able to almost teach me a better way to teach them and it benefits them that whole group rather than just necessarily that student that she came to see so she doesn't do that on like a regular basis but I would say probably once a month she pushes in for one of her sessions as compared to pulling the kids if their speech session happens to be during one of our intervention blocks so it's kind of a nice blend that way because I love it as a teacher. I totally take a lot of her tricks that she uses just with her speech kids mm -hmm. and it benefits that whole group. I, was gonna say, I do have one of those groups and we work on reading skills, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, figuring out who's going to help over speech. Right. And, and that uh, Florida Center for Reading Research, um, UFLY is another one that's free. Um, you could pay for the UFLY manual, I think, but all the resources are free. Um, and West Virginia Phonics are great. They're very scripted, so that helps. That's why we have our paraprofessionals using them as well, because it gives you exactly what to say and what to do. I actually have two quick questions. How many paras and instructional coaches do you have? We have nine paras and two instructional coaches. And what do you do with your kids who do not need intervention during that MTSS time? You're more either middle of the road or above average kiddos. We actually, because they portray it now, I know, I'm sure you've seen it as a pyramid with the tiers. It is now um, displayed as a diamond. So you have to move those higher students too. So we do enrichment with those kiddos who are proficient or advanced. We take them where they are and keep moving them forward. You mentioned tier three students. Mm -hmm. When do they get pulled during the day? We, when we first started this whole process, we also realized that we had a lot of downtime in the morning. And so we extended our homeroom period. Um, the teachers were also saying, this was another complaint from them. We don't get to know our kids. We move into our, our uh, MTSS framework. And we move into those what I need periods too soon. We, we need to get to know our kids. So we extended our homeroom period for 45 minutes so they get to spend that time with their, their homeroom kiddos. And, but the kiddos who are, need tier three are pulled. We send everybody to breakfast immediately. We have them out by 8.30 and then they're pulled from 8.35 to 8.55 um, for that tier three time and then, e every morning. Is that based on the data? Like, Because I know at my school, like the teachers refer kids to MTSS. Yes. Like, do you feel like a referral form that they fill we out? We do or? that in our data meetings. So when the, all the teachers meet, we determine who is the neediest, who, who are the lowest. 
or sometimes actually what we have done a little bit this year is that fourth grade group has so many kiddos who are so low because yeah. of COVID that we've decided to take in that group specifically those bubble kids who are right on that verge of being proficient and we decided to make them a tier three group so we can try to move them up and then work on another group that's really close to move up to proficiency. Thank so that's, that's something new that we've done this year as well. The fourth graders were in kindergarten when COVID hit. <coughs> right, so the end of their kindergarten year and their whole first grade year were not pleasant for them. Um, so can you briefly explain tier one, two, and three, like what is tier one is core. Well, that's what everybody gets. So our goal is to have 80% of our students achieving and proficient it just with that tier one instruction. So that's your, you know, regular classroom instruction. Then tier two is in addition to that and it's more the small group individualized, which really are what I need periods are tier two um, because they are pulled into those small skill-based groups for what each student needs. And then tier three is even more intensive in addition to that. So it was hard for us to fit tier three into our schedule. So that's why we changed that homeroom period and that's in addition to. So they get their core instruction, they get that small 30 minute um, tier two instruction and then they get an additional 25 minutes on um, tier three which is even more intense and unfortunately based groups. on schedules and timing at this point very few kids we have one teacher that's doing tier three for math the rest are doing reading at this point just timing schedules and that's okay though, because we've seen so much yeah. more growth our math with the spring math we have we have seen tremendous growth with math so that's okay because we feel comfort very comfortable with where our scores are right now for the math so we don't need as many kids in those intensive interventions now behavior is that included in there because I've noticed it is it's supposed to be okay it how's is. that work um, we also have tier one tier two and tier three behavior we're applying for fidelity this year for tier one for tier one and um, so we do a lot of instructing up front our wing thing challenges are part of that um, positive behavior things um, and then tier two is typically done by a member of our PBIS team or um, the Dean or the guidance counselor and then tier three is often like outside agency involvement and ironically we cannot get permission slips back from parents to provide those tier three services. We send out 30 and get two back. We call, they still don't. So, you know, a lot of, like the healing patch, we wanted to have the healing patch come in. We have a lot of kiddos who've lost parents. And, um, you know, the kiddos will come to us and say, I just need to talk to somebody. And so we do let them talk but that service is available for free. It's an amazing, amazing program. And people just don't want their kiddos to be part of it. We don't, we don't know what the disconnect is. Maybe, there, maybe it's the education. So we are focusing a lot on educating parents as well um, <clears throat> this year. And I think maybe that's just part of it, that they need to be educated that those services are there for you, not like something to be embarrassed about, but our tier three. Our intervention periods that you're hearing us talk about are more academic yes. periods. These, these tiered um, behavior behaviors interventions. interventions, a lot of those are happening over lunches through like lunch, lunch bunches. Lunch, breakfast. And spa. Yes. They also have that the guidance. So the guidance, yeah, they're getting that. So they're getting a lot of the behavior stuff through the guidance um, coming in. And that's like a stuff. tier one intervention. Everybody gets that. So we, we are doing a lot. Like we do we have added. bullying programs. 
that they're doing through that formal bullying programs um, through that guidance period. So that, that helps a lot as well. And we've added some level, more level one or tier one, um, one, especially in those younger grades. This year we added for kindergarten. So like the teachers did the class-wide teaching of all the rules, but then myself as the learning support teacher our, and our two deans went in and took a turn also and we rotated through the classroom. We would do a read aloud related to one of the rules and we would teach one of the rules and show, we would play games and show like, what does this look like more in the classroom? So they were hearing those rules from multiple people also. So we're really trying to beef up that tier one so we don't have to find as much time for the tier two and tier three for the behaviors. <laughs> Which is the same for academics. If your core is really, really good, you shouldn't have as many students in need of the tier two and the tier three. But with tier two, they will always get that, even if it's enrichment, they will get that tier two no matter what because it's built into the schedule. So that's, that's really nice. I did have a question about the enrichment opportunities. What does that look like when you say enrichment? Um, we actually um, have started administering the COGAT, our STEAM teacher, um, he administers the COGAT, to, which is a gifted screener, to all the students, and then we look at the areas that they're really good at, and we try to push those kind of things more of, on a STEAM level or more advanced reading skills. If it's, if it's a reading intervention time, more advanced reading skills. Um, <coughs> excuse me, we try not to teach anything new during that time, so instead of going up, with skills, we deepen um, the skills that they have. Like math, that's where we're hitting a lot. We are hitting the writing. I know we said earlier that we kind of took a step <coughs> back from the writing with math because it wasn't going so well. So we're using that more just for the kids that need enrichment. They've already got that foundational skill. So it tends to be the math teacher of that grade working with those enrichment kids so she can really work and teach the writing that goes with the math. like like it should look. Like a lot of released items, things like that from the PSSA. She will take those kiddos who have the skill base and help them apply it at a written level. So do you have like a resource room with enrichment um, activities It's all well? one. It's all yeah, it's all in oh. one. And then I had a question about how do you decipher Title I students versus that Tier Two time? Are they still going to Tier Two and then Title I as well? Or is Title, Title I, one I has smaller groups during that tier two time. So Title I pulls, some, some groups decide to switch like 15 minutes, 15 minutes, and they do similar skills and switch groups. Title pulls a smaller, more defined group, and they work for the full 30 minutes through that tier two with the same instructor on um, specific targeted interventions. Is there like cut scores or how do you determine who goes to that 30 minute title versus the tier two intervention? Well, our tier three is actually, that's the lowest of the low where we typically title pulls them in the morning in addition to that tier two during the intervention And we don't time. have a specific score that determines that, it's more of the skill base and... We look at the we, diagnostic the, assessments. We look at the diagnostics and we have X number of spots or X number of periods, like more of that kind of thing, because we want to service as many kids as possible. So we don't have like a, well, if they're at this score, they're going. It's more of a, okay, all of these kids need this skill. Okay, there's enough for one group. Oh no, we need to break this into two groups. And we start with those most foundational skills and kind of work our way up determining who can be in those tier three groups because unfortunately our pyramid were we're making strides in the right direction but our pyramid was completely upside down when inverted. we started this process so we had like 80 percent of kids that needed tier three and 20 percent that didn't so we're working to flip that pyramid back to the right direction so we can't have like a yeah. rigid um it's more of a let's attack these kids first let's get them moving let's attack these kids next baby steps. How long are you keeping them in the tier two interventions or determining whether they move to a, the next one? With progress monitoring. And what tools are you using for progress monitoring? We have the 95% group, um, the PASI 
and the PSI is what we use for our tier three kids. And when they have three progress monitoring scores proficient and above, then we exit them. And they may go into tier three for a different skill, but they're exited from that skill. Did you have a lot of pushback on adding that, those 45 minutes for math and reading because of the core? Like, how did you determine that it was going to be 45 minutes versus 20 minutes? Well, we, we decided on 45 because we wanted to really give them enough time to do it well. We have taken it down to 30 minutes this year because we feel like 30 minutes would be sufficient because they knew the routine now. So now our intervention times are 30 minutes for reading and 30 minutes for math. And um, so that and a lot of the a lot of our interventions themselves are 30 minute interventions. So that helps too. We also have spring math. <coughs> um, you're good. Okay. We also have spring math in that 45 minute long. Last year. Last, Last year. year. Yes, yes, we did. Right. Spring math is now in the core um, because we did rearrange our schedules a little bit. We added more time to math, the math block, but spring math is, is done in the core now. And spring math is sometimes referred to as a class wide intervention. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's also referred to as a core enhancement, mm -hmm. um, similar to what you might see from equity. Right. So, So that you can get your pyramid back within yeah. the scope of reality. <clears throat> yes. And it was thrilling that second grade and kindergarten, two of our grade levels, did that last year. Through And through ironically, grade. they were two of the grade levels we got the most pushed back from. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Yeah. Mm hmm Okay. Um, I know you only have a couple minutes, um, but my main question is, like, I love all the things that you did, and you talked about the very specific things you could do in your district. Um, can you just talk a little bit about, like, getting the whole school and the faculty, like, on the same page? Like, one of the, one of the sessions I went to yesterday was about, like, adults who are not regulated and self-regulated and like on top of their game can't be on top of the student game so like we talked a little bit about getting everyone on the sp same page and you've been talking about pushback and stuff can you just talk about a, like a few things sure. that were memorable absolutely we did um during prep during their prep everybody has common prep so we would pull um grade levels in with the coaches with the administrators she would set the tone for the expectation we would provide them with skills and suggestions for them to achieve as coaches what she expressed as an expectation so we did a lot of working in small groups and then going into the classroom and monitoring and um, you know, helping them build. Like a lot of our senior teachers had classroom management issues. And so she would go to them and say, I want you to reach out to Michelle. I want you to work on classroom management. So then I would go into the classrooms. I would observe what was happening. I would offer suggestions. Well, let's try this. You know, something as simple as, she's like, they don't pay attention. They aren't allowed to have anything on their desks at all. They had tables. They're not allowed to have anything on the tables. Everything goes underneath. She's like, wow, that's amazing. Like simple things like that that you think should be second nature, but for some people it's just not. And so, you know, we would go in and offer those suggestions. Then I would meet with them. Um, they would try it on their own. A few days later we would meet, talk about, you know, what they were seeing, what, what was working for them, what wasn't working for them. I would go back into the classroom. So it was a lot of group teaching and then a lot of individualized based upon what each teacher needed. Yes. What? Five minutes. Um, I was just wondering, what what book would you most recommend that we get started with? I heard you do a lot. You do a lot of book studies. We what do. book would you recommend that we use to get to get up on that diving board? Well, <laughs> uh, um, that's a really good question. Because we, our IU, again, provided us, we went to some trainings and they provided us with a stack of books. 
if you would see our books, it's hysterical. We have post-its in them and, and notes and they're all different, you know, okay, this is one grade that we have to focus on. This is another grade. It depends what you want to focus on. If you are focusing on building your core, we, that's where we use Anita Archer's explicit instruction book. Um, so that sort of gave the teachers the power to build that core and make it stronger, attempting to get that tier one as much as you can out of that tier one. So that's what I would recommend if you are attempting to build that core. If you could provide Absolutely. the books you used and the purpose you used them for yes. that would align to what that you're doing. That would be great because that then, yeah, depending everyone. if you're, okay. yes, if you're looking for the tiered interventions, then I would recommend the one, the book study that we did where we pulled these from for that, you know, specific targeted. No, that's, that's great. We want to make it as helpful for everybody as we can. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. We did write down um, on, the, on the slides our emails and our phone numbers. Feel free to call us. Reach out. Let us know. Um, anything. Anything you need. Simple questions. There is no silly question. And that's what we tell the teachers, too. Ask, please. We, you know, we don't know what you don't know. So please reach out. Help us. That's how we got started. We reached out to this other district. And you know, said, please, what, can we come and observe? Can we look and see how this is run? And, and we probably drove them crazy, but it was so helpful to us to see that in action. So yes, we're happy to help. We'll send the slides. We'll send the books that we used. And um, if you got a little floaty, we have prizes for you. You get to keep your, your floaty too. This is your life preserver that um, is going to keep your head above water. Okay, so if you have one, we're going to... And while you're passing those out, I just want to thank the Kahnemaw Valley team. Thank you um, You so truly, much. for us this morning, you peeled back the curtain and let us take a look at what was behind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's powerful as Amen. each of us are thinking about our roles and our districts and our students and our teams. And we're trying to th think about how can we do this? How can we improve this? What might this look like for us? So we appreciate your vulnerability you uh, yeah. and your ability to bring it to life for us. Um, we recognize you've taken, taken significant strides in your work. We also recognize that you own you're not there yet. And, and it's such a powerful growth mindset to model that for us, that even though you are pleased with where you're headed, you're not quite where you want to be, um, and you're going to keep working. So thank you for giving the contact information as well. I, I know you're going to get a few calls. I can just see it in the eyeballs and the head shakes that we need to talk to you more. And that's what a conference should be about. Not us on a stage preaching, but us learning from each other and creating those networks where we can go beyond this place and continue to learn. So thank you all uh, for your time thank this week. Thank you. Thank you. We and hope we help.